Our next speaker is Professor Claude Rue. Professor Rue is Professor of Forensic Science at the founding and founding director of the Center of Forensic Science at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. He obtained a BS and a PhD in the fiber area in forensic science for the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. He had 19 years of experience in providing forensic science expertise, training, and research. His series of activities and interests cover a broad spectrum of forensic science and include trace evidence, finger mark detection, question documents, forensic training, and management. He is Vice President of the Australian and New Zealand Forensic Science Society, Chair of the Australian and New Zealand Association of Forensic Science Educators and Researchers, and Chair of the forthcoming International Symposium Forensic Science of the Australian and New Zealand Forensic Science Society that is going to be held in Sydney in September 2010. So I'm sure he's going to talk about it at the end, probably. Um, so his talk is, uh, Constructing a database of color and pigment granule patterns for use in human hair identification. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to really thank uh, the organizers, NIJ, uh, the steering committee, for uh, organizing this uh, fantastic symposium. I was there two years ago. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it this, this week. And to continue what Susan Bennett did uh, yesterday about um, you know, a bit of publicity for the Australian Tourism Bureau. Uh, I found Florida a bit like the Gold Coast in Australia, which is close to uh, my friend Gary Asmussen here. Um, but it's a bit the Gold Coast on steroids. So if you want a midget version of Florida, I really advise you and suggest you could come to visit the Gold Coast in Australia. But it's assuming you fancy a 28-hour flight. Um, let's move on. This may be a bit of warning. Uh, I'm not going to give you uh, some guidelines for Dobert hearing. We don't have Dobert uh, hearings in, in Australia. Um, I'm not suggesting or presenting a magic bullet that will solve all the problems of, of a hair examination in, in forensic science or even uh, trace evidence in general. Um, but it's just some, a, a promising approach, uh, in my views, um, that will help to develop some research, strategic research in, in the interpretation of hairs, and, and maybe one day be used in, in, in casework. Um, I should acknowledge my co-authors, and, and probably the main one, who is Liz Brooks. Um, this work, basically, Liz laid the foundation of this work through her master's project with the University of Canberra. She presented her results uh, at the IAFS meeting last year in New Orleans, so my apologies, some of the slides will, will come back. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, she's really the, the star of, the, of, of this project. Um, Lisa Masaki was a UTS student who uh, took part in this project. Uh, Chris Lennard is a professor of forensic science at the University of Canberra, um, supervising a lot of uh, part of the project. And James Robertson, I don't know you. I don't know if he needs any introduction, especially not in, in this uh, hair area. So hair examination. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lecture uh, you about hair examination. We all know, um, you know the, pretty much the process. And we all know that um, traditionally uh, microscopy has been used as, a, you know, as the first step of the examination. Um, Maybe just a few, few words here about the kind of hairs that, especially the AFP found in casework, is, which is interesting in the context of when we talk about the D word. Um, <laughs> they found that 95% pretty much of the, the hairs they have in casework is telogen hair, uh, which, which obviously is, a, is an issue when people want to do nuclear DNA. Uh, and we all know the limitations of, of mitochondrial um, DNA. Now, I, I think next to this session, there will be some discussion about the, the NAS report. And, and um, you know, it's fair to say that there, there are a few, a few comments about hair examination and a few criticisms. And, you know, some of the criticisms are probably um, valid. Um, so I'll let you read that, but it's pretty clear that, you know, there are some questions of, of objectivity, especially in terms of uh, the kind of data that can be gathered from, a, from hair examination. Um, and 
if we go further, um, I'm not going to argue against or for the, the statement uh, by uh, Peter Neufeld here, uh, but in this case in Canada, which uh, was a murder in, in Winnipeg, um, the hair played some part in, in, in this case. Uh, there were three hairs that were declared consistent with um, the, the, the victim, and um, actually mitochondrial DNA later on showed that uh, they were not coming from the victim. And in addition to that, uh, there were hairs from three different persons. So obviously, um, you know, when we talk about microscopic hair examination, um, there, is, there is a problem here. And we all agree that uh, we, we, have to, we have to do something about it. So, okay, we can agree um, that there are, some, there are some issues, but now the, the main question is, so what's the future of forensic hair examination? Um, can, do we put that in the too hard basket and we just do DNA and sometimes when we think that we should do it um, and have more or less an ad hoc approach to the, to the problem of forensic hair examination? Or do we really consider hair as a, a type of trace, like any other type of trace, but simply it happens that hair combines some morphological and biological um, information that should be really treated in a holistic manner if we want to extract uh, the crux of, of, of the information. So I'm not going to do a poll here, but uh, if we are here talking about trace evidence and we're all passionate about trace evidence, I'm, I'm hoping that most people would go for number two. Uh, hopefully I'm not wrong. Um, now if we go a bit about the tool, Microscopy, I mean, it's an integral part of the holistic approach of, to any trace evidence type. Um, we all know that, I mean, you know, there are outstanding microscopists out there, uh, you know, just name Skip Palenik, for example, he, he's in the room. Uh, they can do a lot with the microscope. Now, it's obvious that some people can do much less with the microscopes than others, and I'm probably not, you know, that good with a with microscope compared to, to other people. Um, but what, what, how can we use a microscope, especially in hair examination, uh, to get more objective data? Um, what, what can we do about it? Um, because in terms of objective measurements on hairs, um, most of them are not very helpful uh, when we want to discriminate samples. Uh, things like width, uh, length, etc. they are not the most variable features. Um, so it's what prompted pretty much this work from uh, Lee's originally. So the, the AFP had a significant uh, body of work started over the last, started five years ago approximately. And it developed into a, a very robust project that is pretty much on, on, ongoing. And it's a huge collaboration. I'll talk about that uh, later on. But it's a huge collaboration with, uh, with three universities and, and the Austrian Federal Police. So here the idea is to try to get some um, objective and, and possibly numerical values from microscopy hair examination. And Liz is a microscopist who came to the AFP from the CSIRO, which is a, um, a research, uh, government-funded research organization in Australia. Um, and at the CSIRO, they used to use um, um, a software, a special software to do photo montaging, and it was in the area of forensic and uh, not forensic, sorry, entomology. Um, not everything is forensic. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the approach here, there are three elements. So one is to get very, very good quality uh, digital imaging and digital images from, um, from the hairs. And I'll go back to that. Um, then there is another element. Uh, try to analyze these images uh, and, and try to extract some numerical data from the images. And then obviously to ana analyze uh, objective measures of the human hair features, uh, such as color and pigmentation, uh, as, a, as, as a third step. So the equipment that has been used uh, in the various parts of this study, and which is still going on, uh, so obviously nothing really special. Uh, except the, the software. Um, so we've got a, a microscope, a digital camera, uh, a computer. Um, the, 
the images were taken at 400, uh, magnification, 400 times magnification. Uh, you've got the name of the software here, which uh, basically what it does, we all know it when we deal with 3D uh, objects under a microscope, the issue of having uh, an image fully in focus. So we all know that you know, we have to take uh, several plans uh, you know, when we, we do the examination. And it's why basically, generally, you know, if we draw sketches, we can put more information than taking photos. Now, with this software, what it does, actually, it, it, it allows the analyst to take a, a multitude number of photos for each focal plan and then combine all this as a photo montage. And then the whole photo is, is uh, fantastically in focus. Um, and then we can do all sorts of things because it's digital imaging. So this is the principle behind that. The, so this is the software for the photomontage. And for the image analysis, uh, basically what was used here, it's a V++ uh, software, which is what comes uh, standard with the Polyview system, which is a system sold by Rofin uh, when they sell Polylite. Um, so, but I'm sure that would be other softwares that would do the, the trick here. So just to explain a bit better what I mentioned before, so how, how, how it works. So you've got the hair, the hair shaft here in, 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 in 3D, if you want. And um, you go from one extre extremity of the focal plan to the other one. And for the analysis, what was taken was pretty much the, the mid-third um, mid of, of, of the hair. And you take um, two micrometers steps manually in focus, and you take each time a photo. And then you uh, have the software which will recombine all these single photos into one photomontage image. Uh, so this is the, the, the principle. I should say that the, the hairs were all mounted on, uh, in histo mount, uh, if you are interested in, in that detail. So here you've got just a schematic representation of how, how it works. So you've got each time an image which has part of the, of the hair in, in, in focus, and then you've got, you've got the montage. Now, I'm not a specialist in digital imaging, uh, but we all know that when we deal with digital imaging nowadays, I mean, a lot of things can, can be done because we can then work on the pixels. And so we can work, you know, we can get information about intensity, play, uh, do calculation of contrast, do measurement of colors, um, do, do all sorts of things. Uh, so this is the other advantage. By combining this photo montage, which gives a fantastic in-focus image of a hair, with, uh, with the power of digital imaging when we try to do some calculation on, on the pixels, uh, potentially there is a tool here which is, in my view, interesting. So one first uh, typical analysis that, that's done, or that was done for part of this, uh, of this project, um, it's just the, the color. So there are several models out there. So here you've got three uh, well-known, well-established models for, for color measurements. So the simple uh, combination of the values of, of red, green, and blue. Uh, people playing with videos, they would, they would know that. Then you've got the two other uh, CIA uh, models, uh, which tend to mimic a bit better the, the human uh, vision. Uh, so one looking at the tristimulus X, Y, Z, which gives a sort of a factor of uh, sensitivity depending on the, uh, on, on the sensitivity of the human eye for the, the three uh, fundamental colors. And an, another one which is even closer uh, to the human vision, uh, which is really talks about uh, spheres of, of colors. So I won't go too much into, into these details. Uh, it's, it's well, um, you know, well described and, and well established uh, in the literature and, and in, in the color industry, whether it's paint, dyes, etc. So for example, this is just a, an example, one of the experiments uh, where brown Caucasian hair color was considered. Um, and by looking at uh, 10 image sets, so from 10 different donors, so it equates 25 montage images, it was possible um, by um, you know, then applying some discriminant analysis to discriminate between 10 image sets of, of the brown hairs uh, individuals. So I'm not saying to, you know, to say that uh, this technique is foolproof, fully validated, and 
you have all your problems solved, but it, it, it shows the, the potential and a promises, um, good promising um, value. Now, Lisa, especially Lisa Masaki, uh, extended a bit, did a few more experiments on, on different types of hair colors, uh, not only brown, but she considered uh, blonde, black, and red. And, and here, what you, what you can see on this table, it's, you have the different, the different uh, color models. So very quickly, you can see that the CIE lab uh, is you know, more performing. And, and to be more performing, you should have a, a higher value here. Um, then another thing you can see is the issue of blonde color. Uh, the value are much smaller for blonde color um, than uh, for things like brown. brown. The brown color seems to be more discriminating uh, using uh, our system. Um, now, I have to take that with a pinch of salt. Maybe it's due to the sort of sampling we had for, for the blonde, the blonde color. Um, but it shows, again, some, some good potential. Now, another thing which is well known from, um, from hair examiners, uh, it's, uh, it's pigments. And we all know that it's very, uh, very discriminating. And I will read you um, a small sentence from Paul Kirk, uh, who wrote that in 1940 already. And he was saying that of all the variation um, factors utilized in the individualization of human head hairs, the distribution and appearance of the pigment granules the, um, in the cortex has proved to be one of the best, if, if not the very best. So it's, a, it's an excellent, strong statement. Um, now, the issue here, if we want to try to objectivize um, all this data and do some sort of population study that you, we can do in, 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 uh, in glass or, or even fibers, it's a bit more difficult, but it's still much easier than hair. Here it's very difficult. How can we do that with, with, with pigment granules? Um, so again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advantage of this system to try to get a way to extract this data uh, in, in an objective manner, and that can be then reused for a lot of, of studies and, and research and, and hopefully casework later on. Um, so how it worked here, basically you, you take a part of the, the original dig, digital image, you take a part of the, of the hair, uh, and you extract, extract this pattern. Um, so it's the pattern template. So now, because we are playing with digital images, you know, here, for example, you've got two different hairs from the same person. I should say that to do that, we then uh, um, we transform the, the, the color image into um, you know, a, a grayscale image. So then here, you've got two different hairs from, um, from the same person. And you can see, uh, when you look at here or here, you've got, you know, very similar uh, pigment pattern. And if you do some kind of overlay with the digital imaging, um, you know, you can have the sort of uh, alignment uh, that, you know, it's very, uh, very similar to what people would do, you know, with tool marks, for example, or, or things like that. You can, you can um, you know, make things, I hate the word, but match, basically. Um, so that's one way. But ob obviously, the best way is to do it numerically and try to have more um, objective data. So here what happens, um, you have your image template here. You've got the extracted pattern from uh, the, the question here, for example. And you are going to subtract the pixels uh, values from the image template with the extracted pattern. So what happens if you have a match, your value should be close to zero. So the closer to you are to zero, the better match you have. Um, if you have a hair which is very different, then uh, it wouldn't give the same sort of value. You would have a value which is, because when you do the subtraction, you would have a value which is much higher. So it's a way to get some numerical data that we can use and, and play, play with for, um, for a pattern, pigment pattern uh, examination. 
So obviously, you know, John this morning did an excellent talk talking about statistics and, and what we can do with a, a lot of different tests. So obviously, as soon as we have this sort of data, we can, we can do a lot of things. Uh, I won't go into the details here because I'm sure we didn't, a lot of other things could be done. But here, for example, uh, it's, a, it's a small experiment on blonde hairs where they, all these hairs are from this person, blonde number two. So, you know, you can see the closer you are to zero, the better the match. So for hair one, and so hair one should be the same, so to speak, or it comes from the same scalp as, as BD2, so you've got this value. Now, if you look at BD1, you can see that the value is much, much higher. So readily, you can see that there, it should be discriminated. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that you've got BD6, which is, uh, you know, even, even smaller than, than this one. Now, I, I think there is nothing surprising here because we all know that, you know, when we look at just the, the pigment pattern, although it's very discriminating, yeah, there is always a chance that two different people would have something very similar. So, and you, and you can see the variation, so within one scalp and, and, um, and the comparison of hairs coming from the same hair and versus hairs coming from different, different people. Um, one thing I should add here is with pigment pattern, the important thing is not to consider this extract as a, as a standalone thing, uh, because the pigment pattern really, uh, you know, should be considered in the totality of the hair and, and, and thinking how it contributes uh, how the pigments contribute to the, 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 full, um, the full pattern um, of the hair on, on its totality. Um, now, another thing which is, I don't want to move too much into the D word, but another thing which is very interesting when we talk about microscopy, and as I said before, 95% of the, of the hairs found in casework at the AFP are from telogen hairs. Now, you can do a fishing expedition and send that to biology and say, hopefully, they will get something. And you know, quite often, they don't have anything. Um, or you can try to be a bit more systematic. So um, Liz developed some staining methods um, to try to check, actually, wh where the DNA is and, where, um, and how much of it, and try to see whether there could be a good test here, to, good diagnostic test. Uh, where you could say, okay, there is a good chance we can give that to biology, there is a good chance we could get a good profile. Uh, so here you've got with one fluorescent stain, which is called um, DAPI, and she found that uh, basically you can see roots with more than 30 nuclei um, in, this sort of, in these photos. And you've got another type of stain um, here, which basically stained the, the nuclei, and again, uh, these are examples of fruits with more than, than 30 nuclei. Now the interesting bit is here, so what's the success of nuclear DNA um, on the samples for each nuclear count group? And you can see that, okay, so this is the blank. That's good news, there is no DNA profile. <laughs> um, if you have less than 10 nuclei, you know, no sample uh, return a DNA profile. Um, very small proportion when you have between 10 and 30 uh, nuclei, and then uh, basically, you know, to get a fair chance to get either a full profile or a partial profile, uh, you know, you need more than 30 nuclei. And I think on the top of my head, uh, if you go to 50, um, it's something around 80% chance to get to get a profile. Um, so I, I, that's another, you know, an, another dimension to microscopic hair examination, where um, we can, by using the microscope, we can bring a lot of useful information to microscopic hair examination. Now, I talked about this um, pretty ambitious and bigger project. So because of the, the original work from, from Liz and the good promising results, um, a, a major research grant application was put forward the, the Australian Research Council, and, and it, it got up, and it's a, it's a major, project ambitious, and it got a bit of a good media uh, coverage. Um, and it combines uh, Leica as an industry partner, uh, the AFP, the Australian Federal Police, uh, University of Canberra, and University of Adelaide, where they have a, a center for ancient DNA. 
And the aims of this project, and I thought I would give you a few words here because maybe there are people who would be interested to know what's going on or they are doing something similar. Um, basically, it's the same idea. Try to produce an objective numerical based system for identifying matches among hair samples. So looking at what we, I mentioned before, you know, the color models, uh, pigment pattern recognition, um, other techniques such as chemical imaging, um, you know, even FTIR chemical imaging, there's some people have had some uh, interesting results, X-ray diffraction. And to go on the DNA side, um, trying to continue this investigation about where the DNA is on telogen hairs, um, develop new methods, uh, trying to take some, um, some methods from ancient DNA uh, research and compare all the discrimination, all the discriminating power for, of these different approaches and hopefully offer a new screening sequence and protocol for, for hair examination. So it's early days, it, it, it's just started, but I thought I would, I would mention that to you because it's pretty much a continuum from what I talked before. Um, so in, in, in conclusion here, what I think what's very important is uh, we see a resurgence of research into forensic hair examination. Um, we shouldn't keep hair in the too hard basket. Uh, we should really try to revive all this uh, body of, of research in, in the area. Uh, one thing which is really crucial is really to keep this sort of holistic approach to hair examination. I mean, they, it, it doesn't make sense to have the competing view of microscopy versus DNA, you know, or you know, trace evidence versus biology, chemistry versus biology, etc. Uh, we should really try to get a, a full package, a holistic approach, take the hair as the trace and see what, how can we extract maximum information useful for the case. Um, we, we showed, and, and we've got plenty more data if people are interested, there will be a couple of, of papers uh, published hopefully, but we showed that color analysis and pigment pattern recognition I, you know, are pretty promising um, and, and could generate objective numerical values that we could then use these techniques to do a lot of research. Uh, we could do large scale surveys, um, you know, that have never undertaken with, with hair so far. So it's, you know, things like a lot of the work, for example, we saw this morning, it's, it's very hard to do with hairs for that particular reason that it's difficult to get objective, um, objective values that we can put in statistics, in databases, etc. And the DNA staining methods is, uh, um, you know, again, a promising uh, as a novel uh, screening sequence uh, to put the focus back on microscopy before DNA. Um, and it's probably a hard battle, but uh, it's something which is, which is, which is important. A few acknowledgement. Um, so Leica assisted uh, really a, a lot with this project. CSIRO for, for helping with, a, with this software of photomontaging. Uh, Bruce Comber from the Australian Federal Police, who is a, a fingerprint examiner, um, but an extensive knowledge of the V++ software, so he helped a lot with the digital imaging side of it. Uh, Karen um, uh, McLaren, uh, she started a PhD um, at the University of Canberra. She's, she, she will be working on the, on the microscopy part of the, of the project. Uh, and Janet Edson from University of Adelaide, she will work on, uh, on the DNA uh, part of the project. And obviously all volunteers who gave hairs, uh, hopefully no one is bald now. Um, and I'd like to thank you for, for listening. Uh, and before trying to answer any questions, I would just remind you of this <laughs> symposium. Again, if you fancy a very nice flight, you will hold the, this symposium next year in September. We would love really to, to have you there and have a very strong um, presence for, for trace evidence. Um, thank you. Questions? Hi, Claude. I have I have two questions actually. The first is on the um, on the montaging. Did you have any difficulties with features that were directly beneath other features within the hair when you created the montage? Did you lose information as opposed to looking at several individual slices? Yes, I see what you mean. Now, they, I think it's, it has all to do with uh, how, how we can optimize, basic, how many images we need. You know, it's sort of a, and I, it's pretty much similar to a resolution issue, if you want. Obviously, the more, the more steps, the finer steps, the more photos you have, the more. 
So w we found that the two micrometer step um, were, were good enough for, for the purpose of, of the examination. Okay, good, thank you. And on the um, pigment pattern matching, did you, how did you select the size of the pattern that you were going to look for? And did you also consider the number of times that that pattern repeated as part of your match criterion or your associative yeah. information? Okay, for, for the size, I'll have to go back to you and check the details. For the pattern, uh, the, the selection, the, normally the way it, it, it was done is to try to find a, a, a place on the hair which has had a very repetitive pattern try to identify a place which we could, we could say this is a, it's very repetitive along the hair um, and very repetitive hopefully within uh, two hairs of the same, of the same scalp. Did you count the number of times um, Again, I'll have to go back to you. Okay, let's thank again our panel for such a good work.